Amen. So John chapter 7. So last week we looked at kind of the whole theme of the chapter, which is there after Jesus. He goes up to um, the feast here, or down, I guess. You know, they say, you know, he goes down in elevation, but he goes, well, he goes up in elevation, but down south to Jerusalem um, to the feast. And they try to kill him. They're trying to, they're coming after him. We talked about last week how they're after Jesus because he was good. And that's the same reason that people will hate us if we do good, all right? We're never going to be good, but Jesus was good, and that's why if we follow him, um, people will be upset at us for doing good. It was no different in Jesus' time. So in John chapter 7, um, we're going to start in verse number 36, and I'm going to preach through just four verses tonight and just kind of explain what Jesus says here in John chapter 36 from um, 36 through verse number 40, we're going to cut that up, but I just want, I really like verse number 31, just as a, an introduction. It says, many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man had done? They're basically saying, like, this must be him. <laughs> this must be the Christ. It's like, is somebody else going to come and do better, greater things? I don't think so. So they believed on him for those reasons, and that's why, you know, Jesus did the, those miracles to prove that he was God. But look down at verse number 36, if you would. Let's look at um, what Jesus is saying here in these four verses. It's they, the people said, what manner is this that he said, ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. In the last day, that day, great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So this is a very similar type of statement that Jesus said to the woman at the well when he said, you know, you know, she's drawing actual water. And again, we see Jesus is using this figure of speech here. She's drawing actual water, and he says, I'll give you living water, and you'll never thirst again. And of course, she doesn't understand um, right away what he's talking about. But look at verse number 38. Jesus kind of adds on to that statement from the woman at the well in verse number 38, where he says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, this is not talking about a literal river flowing out of your belly here, okay? That's not what Jesus is talking about. Generally, what is he talking about? In verse number 38, he's saying that this is going to happen to people who believe on me. So what is he saying here? So what happens when someone believes on or trusts on Jesus or trusts Jesus? It means that they are saved, that they are given eternal life at that point. So a general term, or a general way of saying verse number 38, when he says, out of his belly shall flow living rivers of living water, generally he's talking about salvation here. He's talking about someone that is being saved. I'm going to talk specifically what he's talking about um, is kind of the point of this sermon, but look down at verse number 39 um, for a little bit more context um, in John chapter 7. So again, he says rivers of living water, that's not talking about literal rivers, you know, that, that's not, you know I, I don't think anyone's made a weird doctrine out of that, but they probably have. Um, but he's talking about salvation, okay? So in verse number 38, he's talking about somebody that believes on Jesus is going to have this figurative thing happen to them, ri this rivers of living water. Now in verse number 39, he gives us a little bit more specific detail about verse 38. He says, but this spake he of the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit here which they that believe on him should receive. So again, people that believe on Jesus are saved, are granted eternal life. But what Jesus is doing here, and I'm sure not many people are catching this because they don't have the whole Bible with them at the time, and we're actually very lucky to be able to look at the words of Jesus and study them back and understand the exact details of what he's actually talking about here. But he's saying, they that believe on him should receive. So he's talking about, now he gives us some more detail. What does he do? He gives us more detail about salvation here. He's giving us kind of the mechanics of salvation. He's saying, people that believe on him, so people that are saved, are going to receive this spirit. They're going to receive the Holy Spirit. But then he says, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So that can be a little confusing. In verse number 39, he's saying people that believe on Jesus are going to, you know, they have the Spirit, but then he says, but the Spirit hasn't been given yet. So what are, we, what are we talking about here? Look at verse number 40. It says, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So I'm going to explain 
these, really these three verses, really, I'm sorry, these two verses to you, verse number 38 and verse number 39 in the next um, few minutes. That's kind of going to be the purpose of the sermon tonight. As a matter of fact, the title of the sermon is The Purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Purpose of the Holy Spirit. Really, what we're going to look at first is the mechanics of your salvation. You say, what do you mean? I'm going to talk about like how your salvation works. We well, say, well, from my perspective, all I did was trust on Jesus and then it worked. But yes, but how does God accomplish that? How does God accomplish passing you from death to life? That's what we're going to talk about this evening. And I'm going to show you the purpose of the Holy Spirit, not only in your salvation, but in your Christian life as well. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and look at verse number 19. This was a super important verse for us in the last few years. <laughs> look at verse number 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? So the Bible here is saying, we're talking about the purpose of the Holy Spirit tonight, and first of all, I want to talk about the purpose of the Holy Spirit in your salvation. What part does the Holy Spirit play in you being passed from death to eternal life when you trusted on Jesus in that moment? in that moment that you believed on Jesus or trusted on Jesus. The Bible here is saying in 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking obviously to saved um, people here. He's saying that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, meaning the body of a saved person contains the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is within a saved person, is what the Bible is teaching us here. It's saying it's the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is what? Which is in you. The, look, literally, the Holy Spirit is in you, which ye have of God. Where did it come from? From God, okay? And ye are not your own. So, look, this was an important verse when people were out there trying to force, you know, you to put things in your body that you didn't want to put in your body. You know, this was one of the things that the Christian could, you know, rightly write down and say, look, my body is not my own. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I belong to God. I can, I, you know, you can't force me to, this was a definite Romans 13 situation where you have an authority telling you, you know, take this shot or whatever, and you're saying, no, this body isn't mine as a Christian. This body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, and I, I you know, I can't put something that, it violates my Christian faith to put something that is unclean in this temple of God. Now, this also should make you rethink you know, going out and abusing your body, you know, just personally. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we like the, this verse in certain situations, but when it comes to, you know, getting free from sin and walking away from sin in your life and not, you know, doing horrible things with your body, you know, it, it puts it in kind of a different context when you realize that, you know, you're walking around as a temple of the Holy Ghost. And this is why the Bible says, we'll talk about it a little later, you can actually upset the Holy Ghost that's within you. All right, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So, you contain, inside of you, if you are saved, you contain the Holy Spirit. We're looking at the mechanics first of your salvation. We're looking at the mechanics of your salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, and look at verse number 10. So, the question is, if the Holy Spirit is inside me, and it's inside you, how did it get there? How did it get there? We know it came from God. How did that work? Isn't it nice that you know, like the, God doesn't have to tell us any of these things? He doesn't have to tell us the mechanics of how you saved. He could have just, he could have just said John chapter 3, and that would have been it. He didn't have to tell us all these details, but he is telling us all these details. And the reason that he's telling us all these details is because the Holy Spirit is not only important in your salvation, but it's also important in your Christian life. And we're going to talk about that this evening. So, it's in you. The Holy Spirit is inside you if you're saved. How did it get there? Look at verse number 10 of Ephesians chapter 1. The Bible says that in, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather... Okay, let me just explain what that means because we said a, a crazy word there, dispensation of the fullness of times. It means that when God decided it was right for Jesus to come. It's really complicated. Let's create a whole new denomination of Christianity just on that one word. Okay, anyway. The dispensation of the fullness of time, meaning that time is now. The time is ready. It's, it's time for, you know, this is, God, God works on this. It's just like, 
you know, the, uh, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It's exactly the same type of, of, of statement. Meaning, the, pe the wicked people of the promised land, they have not, you know, provoked God to wrath enough yet during Abraham's time, but God was just telling Abraham what was going to happen 400 some years into the future. That's it. Then that time is going to be full. In the fullness of times, and look, you want to know why God chose when to send Jesus at this exact time, when that meant that the time was full? Let's ask God when we get to heaven. I mean, it's not that important. It's important to know that Jesus came at this time, and that was the time that God chose. The time was full. Jesus came at this time. That's all we need to know. All right? We don't have to make up all kinds of weird stuff just because, you know, just because. All right? In the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have in, obtained an inheritance. This is talking about the, the inheritance of our salvation being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worked all things after the counsel of his own will. Okay, that again, you know, it is the will of God that all men be saved. Okay, so every single person who's ever been born their, their destiny according to the will of God is that they would be saved, that they would believe on Jesus. Does, that, does everyone fulfill their destiny? No. Is that God's fault? No. God did everything, and he wants all men to be saved. The Bible is very clear about this. I've preached extensively about this, and, you know, this idea that some people were... You know, people see you're predestined, and they're like, oh, some people were predestined to be saved, and some... It's nowhere in the Bible. Right. Everybody is predestined for salvation according to the will of God. Yeah. It is not, you know, God's desire that any would go to hell, that any would not believe on his son. John 6, 40, the will of the Father is that you would believe on the son. That's the, the will of God for everyone. Not everyone is going to realize that destiny. Look, I, I got news for you. Not every saved believer is going to fulfill the predestination that God has for them. As a matter of fact, zero will fulfill it perfectly. The predestination of the believers is, is that you would get saved and then you would, you would live a Christian life and be conformed to, to Christ. And we're all going to fall short of that. All right? Not the point of the sermon. Look at verse number 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. We're talking about saved people here in whom ye, again, he's talking to a group of saved people in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. The, what's the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. This is, look, this is super important in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. It's, it's the verse that explains that believing on Jesus is not believing Jesus existed. Or believing that, you know, Jesus died on the cross even. It's trusting on that. It's not, oh, I believe. Look, I was Lutheran my entire life, and there was never a time since I was a conscious person that, you know, since I was five, six, seven years old and up from, you know, five to 30-something or whenever I got saved, there was never a time where I didn't believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But I was just as unsaved as somebody who never even heard of Jesus. It's trusting on that. And that's why this verse, it, these verses are so important. It is about trusting on Christ. Look, I could trust on Jesus, but I also believe I have to do... No, no, no. That's not trusting on Jesus. You must trust completely on Jesus, 100% or zero, or zero. Now, what happens when you do that? After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were what? Sealed. Now he tells us how it works. Now he explains how the mechanics of your salvation works. He says, after you believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Look, you're sealed with it. That's what it's used for. That's what it's used for in your, and that's how it got inside you. It's inside you to seal you. It keeps you. It's, it's a promise of eternal security is what it is. It, just like the Bible teaches in all other places, about eternal security, you can't become unsaved because are you stronger than God? The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is what seals you. You are not some strong man that can break that seal 
of the Holy Spirit. I mean, what is the promise? Well, you believe on the Son, you hath everlasting life. That is the promise. And the Holy Spirit seals you unto that promise. That's why verse 13 is just such a great, such a great verse in the Bible. Now look, there's a lot of people that believe in works-based salvation that say, and I sort of believed this at one time in, in my 20s, I think, when I think back on it. But there's some people that believe they get around the eternal life thing by saying, oh yeah, but eternal life begins when you die, physically. The only problem with that is the Bible. The only problem with that is, you know, many verses in the Bible, John 3, 36 being one of them, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, like right now. It doesn't say you're going to get it whenever you pass away physically. It says you hath everlasting life. But also the very next verse that we're going to look at here. Look at verse number 14. So the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the purpose of the Holy Spirit tonight. And the first purpose is in the mechanical, mechanical, you know what I'm saying with mechanical. It's just how your salvation works through the Holy Spirit. It seals you. It seals you unto the promise of everlasting life. Now, a lot of people that say, well, maybe everlasting life starts after you die, they're going to have a lot of problems with verse 14 because it says, which, what is which? The Holy Spirit that seals you in verse 13 is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So what the Bible here is saying is that God gives you that seal, that guaranteed promise of eternal life at the moment you believe, at the moment you trust. And you're sealed at that point until, so he covers that time period. He literally covers the time period from the time you get saved to the time you physically die. Is there any detail that's not in the Bible? I mean, does God have to give us that detail? He could have just been like John 3, 36. That's it. Believe it. That's the way it is. But instead, he just gives us this great detail. For all these people, would be like, well, maybe. No. He's saying you're sealed, and it's the earnest. It's, it's the down payment. He gives you an earnest, like, a, like an earnest payment. To, to what? To, to get the possession for you, to lock that possession for you. He says... He does that with the Holy Spirit, gives you that seal until the redemption, until he comes back to raise you in that first resurrection unto your glorified self, unto the praise of his glory. So he's literally telling you how he keeps you eternally secure from the moment of John 3.36, from the moment you trust in Jesus. So you believe on Jesus, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, which is the is the down payment that secures you, and then you are resurrected to glory. That's how the Holy Spirit works in your salvation. Now go back to John chapter 38 and look at ver John chapter 7 and verse number 38. John chapter 7 and look at verse number 38. So I said generally verse number 38 was talking about salvation or everlasting life. But now specifically you can see what he is talking about in the very first part of verse number 39. He says, But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Stop. That's what I was just talking about. When he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that's what you are going to receive when you believe on him, when you get saved. Ephesians chapter 1, turn to Ezekiel chapter 47. And we're gonna, now we're going to look at the second part of Jesus' statement. But if you write in your Bible, you just, cir or just circle or make a line before that colon there. It says, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about Ephesians chapter 1, 10 through 14, is what he's talking about in the very first part of verse number 39. But now, in the last part of verse number, this one verse is so deep, and it probably, you can just see that it just went over everybody's head that he was talking to at this time. But look at verse, the last part of verse number 39. As you're turning to Ezekiel chapter 47, I'm going to show you something really cool in Ezekiel chapter 47. All right? Look at verse, the last part of verse 39. Jesus says, it says, or the Bible says, for the Holy Spirit was the Holy Ghost. Now, it, verse number 39 is not Jesus speaking. It is the narrator of the Bible. It is, the, it is literally the Holy Spirit speaking. It is literally the Holy Spirit explaining itself to us. All right? 
And look, I'm glad that those parentheses in verse 39 are there because it gives us a lot of context of what Jesus is talking about in verse number 38 when he talks about those rivers of living water. Look at the last part of the verse as you're turning to Ezekiel chapter 47. The Holy Spirit, or the Bible says this, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So there's two things. There's two things here. There's the Holy Spirit that you are given when you're saved. And then there's another giving, so to speak, of the Holy Spirit that has not yet happened. Okay? You're guaranteed the first one if you're saved. You're not guaranteed the second one if you're saved. The second one depends on you. And to get a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about, the last part of verse number 39, I know we're getting, getting deep here, but just follow me. If you, to get a deeper understanding of what Jesus is talking about, the last part of verse 39, he's talking about these rivers of living waters that are flowing out of you. So yes, he was talking about salvation, but he was also talking about the Holy Spirit that is given at a later time. Look at Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47 is um, describing Ezekiel's temple. And I'm not even going to give my opinion on what that is tonight, but I want to show you something interesting about this temple and about the description of something that is happening in and around Ezekiel's temple. Look at verse number one. And let's just read for a few verses here. Talking about Ezekiel's temple here. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued. Here we go. We got water out of the, from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Talk about this, this temple that it doesn't exist at this time. Okay? Then brought me, he brought me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without under the utter, utter I can't read tonight for some reason, out of the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. That's a hard sentence, okay? That's not the easiest sentence to read. <laughs> read that one ten times fast. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. So here we see waters are running out of this temple. And when the man that had a line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. So the water's not that deep, okay, at this point. Now look at verse 4. He measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, the waters were to the knees. It's getting deeper. And again, he measured a thousand and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Now they were up to his waist. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. This river was too strong, it was too large, and it was too powerful to be crossed over by a man. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar to the same type of living water, the same type of spirit that we see that cannot, this seal in, is in Ephesians chapter 1? Now look at verse number 6. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Look at verse 7. And when I returned, behold, at the bank of the river were many trees on one side and on the other. Then he said unto me, these waters issue out towards the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. So these waters go everywhere. Now look at verse number 9. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever, not everything that liveth and moveth, where the waters are. Look at the next verse. Whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed. And everything shall live, whether the river cometh. This powerful river, this river that cannot be passed by man, cannot be crossed by man, it will bring life wherever it goes. Isn't that a beautiful picture of salvation? That's a beautiful picture of salvation. And now that you see how the Holy Spirit is used in salvation, you can see how Jesus was explaining in verse number 38, what he was really explaining specifically was this is how the Holy Spirit is going to work for you. This, when he's talking about those rivers of living water, Jesus is talking about the work that the Holy Spirit is going to do in salvation 
and beyond salvation. Look at verse number 10. I mean, there's just life everywhere. There's just life everywhere that this river goes. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Agedi even unto Eneglum, and they shall place, be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. But in the miry places, verse number 11, thereof, and the marishes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. I'll go back to that one in a few minutes. But, I mean, basically saying this water is not going to be received everywhere is what he's saying about in verse number 11. It's going to be stagnant in places. It's not going to be flowing everywhere. But beyond, look at verse number 12. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side. Now look at this. This river, this powerful, uncrossable river that brings life everywhere it goes, this is what is on both sides of that river. Everything that that river touches, it says, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. What the Bible is saying here in Ezekiel chapter 47, and especially verse number 12, is explaining the last half of, of John chapter 7 and verse number 39. He is saying, where these waters flow freely, they will bring life, and they will be very fruitful. Go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22. The Holy Spirit, this is what Jesus is explaining. He's saying the Holy Spirit, if followed if allowed to flow and not kept stagnant, the Holy Spirit, if followed, will be fruitful. The Holy Spirit is what brings the fruit. The Holy Spirit is what brings the life, and the Holy Spirit is what brings the fruit. The river, the river of living water. Look at Galatians 5.22. Again, the Bible just completely just backs up, but yeah, the Bible was written by a bunch of different people. Give me a break. Look at this. Look at Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Look, you may not be able to tell. You may not be able to tell if all people are saved. And look, sometimes I, I get it, but you know, it, it's, it's difficult to tell if some people are saved. I mean, we try to find out if people are saved when we go out soul winning so we can know if we need to give somebody the gospel or not. But look, the fruit of the Spirit is a good outward indication. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. And I'm not, look, I'm not trying to get like, you know, mystical about this, but I mean, the fruit of the Spirit and, and this Spirit within saved people is a real thing, and it is, I'm, I'm sorry, but it is recognizable. Look at Romans chapter 8, and look at verse number 14. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 14, the Bible says this, it says, For many as are led by the Spirit of God, this is the second half of verse 39, not only are these people saved, but they are allowing themselves to be led by that Spirit in them. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, for you have not received the spirit of bondage, Again, to fear. So he's trying to convince people to let this spirit that is in them, hey, you're a son of God, you have the spirit in there. Let it lead. Don't receive the spirit of bondage, which is just this, he's talking about following the flesh. Don't just voluntarily put yourself back into slavery to sin, is what he's saying. Because nothing, sin has no power over you once you're saved. Because why? Because you're sealed. Let it lead you. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. You've been adopted with that spirit. The, the spirit that sealed you is the spirit of adoption. It's the mechanics of your adoption. Now look at verse 16. The spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now look, I... I think that, you know, you can extrapolate this to believe. And like I said, don't get, I'm not trying to get mystical or weird about it. But when the Bible here is saying that this spirit, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. And guess what? I have the same spirit inside me that you have inside you. And that spirit will bear witness 
with itself. So, I mean, when you, like, talk to somebody that claims Jesus, but they're just super nasty, and they're upset that you're even at their door, and you're like, there's somebody, there's somebody walking down the street with a Bible, and they're like, yeah, we're Christians, get out of here! You're just like, I'm not trying to pass, you know, God's judgment here, but, you know, it's like, that spirit, there's no spirit connection there. You know, I'm not seeing, you know, that, that kindred Holy Spirit. That, you know, somebody that claims, it just shows you that, look, folks, we know this. Everyone that claims Jesus is not saved. So how can that be that someone that claims to be a Christian is yelling at somebody and calling, you know, there's one specific church in town where we, like, all, you, several people we've met from their church literally, like, kick us out of their neighborhood. We're Christians. Get out of here. We're just preaching the gospel to people. We're not trying to take people away. Get out of here with that stuff. You're just like, what's going on? What's going on with that Christian? There's no, you know, there's no spirit connection there. Go back to verse number 39. Verse number 39, and let's look at that last half. Let's look at what Jesus is talking about, that the Holy Spirit is not yet given. Actually, turn to Luke chapter 12. You know, Luke, uh, verse 39 is talking about, you know, he talks about first the Spirit that is given to people that believe on him, and then he says the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit has not yet been given. What is he talking about? What he's talking about specifically the first time this happens in the Bible, is in Acts chapter 2, on the day of ben, uh, Pentecost, when they are baptized with the Holy Spirit, or they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Same thing in the Bible. All right, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Please, let's not go and create a whole new weird religion where we redefine baptism and, you know, take Acts 2.38, and we'll take that one verse and misinterpret that one verse, and then we'll create a whole false religion on that one verse that throws the rest of the Bible right out the window. We'll ruin one verse, and then but, well, we can't use any of the other Bible now, now that we've wrecked this one verse. Turn to Luke chapter 12. So Jesus is talking about the day of Pentecost after he has been uh, resurrected, after not only his resurrection, but he has been ascended, he has ascended to heaven, and after Jesus is gone, the very first thing is the Holy Spirit comes upon the... Um, they already have the Holy Spirit with them, but they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they do this great miracle of speaking all these different languages to do what? To have a purpose to preach the gospel. I mean, Jesus didn't just go and just do a bunch of magic tricks. That He didn't do like card tricks. He healed people. He did miracles that meant something. These guys had the Holy Spirit fill them, and they spoke in all these different languages, where all these different people from all these different nations were in Jerusalem, and they performed this great miracle. To, for what purpose? To get people saved. To preach the gospel. Look at Luke chapter 12. We see another example um, of this. The, the, the Holy Spirit kind of, God promises us that the Holy Spirit will help us too. You say, well, Acts chapter 2, is that the only time? No, the exact same promises are available to us. Look at verse number 11 of Luke chapter 12. The Bible tells us when, you know, a specific case where the Holy Spirit will fill us and come upon us. I mean, this is an extreme situation, but look, it's very relevant, and I'm glad, um, and there's a reason that God told the disciples this, because Many of them were going to go through this. Look at verse number 11. It says, When they bring you into the synagogues and under the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. The Bible here is saying, look, this is something that I've thought about. I don't know if you've thought about this before, but, and I know it's kind of hard to think about this with, you know, the, the society that we live in and we kind of, uh, kind of live in a free country, sort of, and we're not really persecuted for our faith. But there's a lot of history on Christians being tortured and being put through the, the worst possible scenarios you can possibly think of. And when they're being put through those scenarios, you know what they're being asked to do? When they're being put through that terrible pain and that terrible torture, they're being asked to deny Christ. They're being asked to deny Christ. Now, what does it matter if they deny Christ, are they going to lose their salvation? No, they're not going to lose their salvation, but it would kind of matter for the people around them. 
it would kind of matter for the witnesses that are watching these scenarios. And if you read documented accounts of the martyrs, some of the greatest stories of the Christian faith are martyrs in their last moments. And you say, how can that be? And look, I've read a lot of these things. A lot of them are in the martyr's mirror. And, a lot of the, and that's what I love reading the most is the statements that these men and women make when they're being tortured to death, when they're being burned to death or whatever is happening to them because they make these great, profound statements. And honestly, I would worry myself that if I was put into some extreme duress like that, obviously you would like to be killed quickly if you're going to be killed for Christ. Beheading is pretty good when you've read, read a lot of these stories. But I would worry that I would say something that would discourage people around me, discourage people around me. But God gives us this great promise here. God gives us this great promise. says, hey, hey, when that happens, this is what's going to happen to you. And look, every single one of the disciples except John died a horrible death. And they tried to kill John, according to secular history. They tried to boil him in oil, but God miraculously saved him. That's not in the Bible, but that's in um, several history books, several history accounts. And then they banished him to the island of Patmos. God kept him alive. But many of these men, all of these men, went through terrible suffering and terrible deaths. And they all professed Christ to the end. So it's a nice promise that the Holy Spirit gives us when we look at these men and be like, I, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I'm brave enough for that. I don't know if I'm tough enough for that. The Holy Spirit says, I got you. The Holy Spirit says, in that time, in that moment, I will, just, I will, I will give you the words to say. You won't have to worry about crying out or screaming out you know, like, a, like a coward or a baby or whatever. And, and no one would even blame a, a human being for screaming out for mercy or in, in situations like that. No one would even blame it. But you know what actually happens is when those men and their congregations are around them as they're burning and, they just, and they're trying to offer the, the person burning water and all this, when the person says, no, no water for me, the Lord Jesus Christ will have me in just a moment. And they say all these great professions of faith. You know what that does? That, that fills the people outside that see that with the Spirit. It gives people hope that there's this great, you know, it's a great witness to people. Yeah. That's why the Hebrews 11 is talking about the faith chapter. It's so, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12. Amen. It's like, if they can do it, and look, but we have this promise. And then guess what? Turn to Acts 7. We actually, then you ask, why does God give us such great detail about what happened to Stephen? Because God is literally demonstrating to us in Acts chapter 7 how Luke chapter 12 is going to work. Because in Acts chapter 7, we see the first person, the first Christian that is killed. That is the detailed account of the first Christian that's killed is, is the deacon Stephen. And look, look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. We get this great sermon from Stephen that we studied through when we studied the book of Acts. And look at verse 54. He preaches, look folks, these are ordinary people. These are ordinary people. And he gets up and he preaches this great sermon, so much so, that look at this. When they heard these things, after his sermon, verse 54 of Acts 7, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Look, when you preach a sermon that is so powerful that everyone wants to kill you, that was a good sermon. Okay, when you've got a bunch of evil people, if there's you know, a crowd of evil people, and I would want to preach a sermon that was so spirit-filled that they all wanted to kill me. Then I'm like, yes, I did my job. But look at verse 55. How do you do it? How do you do it? Look at verse 55. But he, what? Being full of the Holy Ghost. Looked up. That is exactly what God promised in Luke 12, 11. I will fill you with the Holy Ghost, and I will give you the words to say. And then in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7, he literally shows us how he does it. He, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I always like to think that Jesus stood up for Stephen there because Jesus sits on the right hand of God. So look, folks, here's what I'm trying to get at this evening. Here's what I'm trying to get at this evening, and I want to really focus on the last part of verse 39 now. If you look back at Acts chapter 6, 
What I really want to get you to understand as a saved believer who's a temple of the Holy Ghost, who is sealed by the Holy Ghost, is that you have the Holy Spirit in you. Why not use it? Don't leave that one on the table. You know, the, the fruit of the Spirit is available to every saved person. If you look back at Acts chapter 6 and verse number 8, look what Stephen was doing. Stephen, well, he was full of the Holy Ghost before he even got in trouble. Look at what he was doing in verse 8. It says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles amongst, among the people. Look, before he was filled with it to speak, the river was already flowing out of him. He was already out there doing great wonders, just doing great things. He was full of faith and power. So look, you have two choices in your Christian life. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You have two choices in your Christian life. You can either grieve the Holy Spirit that is in you. You can either go against the Holy Spirit that is in you, upset the Holy Spirit. You can let it stagnate. You can let it fill up in, in your, your, your polluted temple that is, you know, and turn it into a marsh. Or you can let it flow out of you as it wants to do. In verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse 19. The Bible says this. I mean, it gives such a great example, a great picture of what the Holy Spirit is. It says, quench not the Spirit. The Holy Spirit inside you is this river. It's this fire. And it's saying, don't put it out. It wants to, to flow out of you. So how do I not quench the Spirit is the next question. We'll just read the next four verses. Look what it says. Don't quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. You know what that means? Read the Bible. Listen to the Bible. Despise not preaching. When you hear preaching preached that maybe you don't like, despise it not. If it's in the Bible, despise it not. And then, look, verse number 20 applies directly to verse 21. Because you can't do verse 21 if you don't do number 20. Or verse number 20. It says, despise not prophesying. So you're reading the Bible. You're listening to the Bible. And then guess what? You can prove all things. What does that mean? That means every single thing that somebody te teaches or you read, you compare it to the Bible. You look at it through the lens of the Bible. I am so glad that I have the lens of the Bible. You have no chance in this world today if you don't have the lens of the Bible. I mean, there's some things that are ridiculous and a complete clown circus out there, but there's a lot of things that are just very confusing. And I'm glad that you can just look at everything through the lens of the Bible. And then when you find something that's good, hang on to it. Hold fast to it. Look at verse 22. We're talking about how to quench, not quench the Spirit. Like, literally, verse 19 is telling you the main goal, and verse 20, 21, 22 are telling you how to achieve that goal. And then it says this, abstain from all appearance of evil. You say, well, what, is that? what does that mean? That, that's telling you God's standards for separation right there. Amen. It's saying, what do you mean, abstain from all appearance? What about doing evil? No, it's, it's, it's talking about the high standard of coming out from among them. It's talking about the high standard. It's saying, not only don't do evil, it's like, don't even, uh, be, don't even appear to be doing evil. It's talking about, you know, like these people that are like, I'm going to go to the bar, but I'm not going to drink. I mean, that's a silly example for us, but I mean, just people that are like, I'm going to hang out with a bunch of idiots that are, that are doing bad things. You know what's going to happen if you hang out with a bunch of idiots? You're going to appear like an idiot. And the Bible is saying, abstain from all appearance of evil. It's saying, don't be anywhere near it, is what the Bible is talking about here. It's, it's just it's showing you God's high standards of separation. So look, follow the Holy Spirit and let it flow from you instead of quenching it. That's the second choice. The first choice is quench it. Don't separate from anything. Don't separate from sin. Just don't you know, get into all kinds of trouble. You'll quench the Spirit within you. You, you, you will see it. You will feel it happen. You will quench the Spirit within you. Look, it's not going to make you unsealed but you will quench it from flowing out of you and, be, and doing what? Causing all those trees to grow in the banks and create all that fruit in your life. As the Holy Spirit flows out of you, it creates fruit everywhere it goes. And it will stop 
all of that. But the second question, the, the second choice is, is just follow the Spirit. I mean, doesn't this seem so easy? Doesn't it seem so easy? If we didn't have any distractions around us and all we could hear was the Spirit within us, it would be easy. But it's the distractions and it's the noise of everything around us. Look, but when it, when it boils down to it, folks, it really comes down to this. It's, it's like, it's the choice for the Christian I'm talking about now. It's the choice of a worthless life versus a life of great faith and power. I mean, who would choose the worthless life? Yet that's what we do when we're quenching the Spirit in our lives. Anyone who is saved can do this. Galatians 5.25, right when it, after it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, says if we live in the Spirit, let us also... Look, you live in the Spirit. If you're saved, you live in the Spirit. But it's saying if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And then that Spirit will flow out of you and, and do what? It'll create new fruit. This is a choice in your Christian life. See, a lot of people, they think, a lot of people think, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. A, a lot of people think that, you know, I'm not that smart. I'm not that important. I'm not that great of uh, anything, really. But, you know, I can't do great things. You know, it's true. You're not that great. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who are smarter than you. <laughs> so there's plenty of people who are smarter than me. But guess what? You are a vessel of the Spirit within you. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I can't remember where I was going to go here. I can't remember the verse I was going to go to there, but it's talking, you know, it's talking about how you know, we are a, we're a vessel of the Holy Spirit. You know, we should be a clean vessel unto honor, and we should not be a vessel you know, unto, we should not be a corrupted vessel. So the holy thing, the, the, the Bible says this, it says, you know, if you think that I can't be used to do great things, this is kind of back to the point that I'm trying to make. If you think that God can't use you to do great things, why do you think that he used such ordinary people in the Bible to do these great things? He used ordinary people. You are just a vessel of the Spirit. You aren't great. You aren't great. You are nothing special. So why not follow something that is greater than you? Remember we did this sermon series. I did this sermon series just on 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 27. Actually, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at verse number 27, where God uses, you know, the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. That's the first part of that verse, and that's what I preached that whole sermon series on, how God takes these powerful people, these rich people, the kings, the, the CEOs, these uber-powerful people in this world, and he just, he just turns them into fools. He's got them all out there. And you've got these people that have got an IQ of 170-something, and they spend their whole life chasing aliens. They spend their whole life talking about things that aren't real. It's because God is confounding the wise. But what is the last part of that verse? Then, you know what it says? It says, he uses the weak things of the world. Guess what? That's you. He uses the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. So what he's saying is, he's going to confound the people that think they're powerful. He's going to turn them into fools and make them chase foolish things. And he's going to use the weakest people to do the mightiest works. How is he going to do that? Through the Holy Spirit. That's how. If you allow the Holy Spirit to do that. Look, this is great news for any person that is just wondering, like, what in the world? You got all these people out there trying to make themselves great. They're just going to be confounded into foolish things. When, you know, when all they have to do 
is, is just get saved and then follow what God has already given them. And guess what? They'll, they'll, just, they'll have great faith and power, and they'll do great signs and wonders. Great exploits, as the book of Daniel says. I mean, think about getting somebody saved. I mean, you could, somebody that's passed from eternal death to eternal life by you? I mean, that's a, how's that not a miracle? How is that not a miracle that, you know, you, some weak person, has just, it's, it's verse number 21. I just saw it. If man therefore purge him from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You purge yourself from the garbage, and now you're a vessel of the Holy Spirit that God can actually use. That's what the Bible is saying there. But look, how is it not a miracle of some weak, poor, not that smart person going out and preaching the gospel and getting somebody saved. That's a great miracle. How is it not a miracle that children today, if raised according to what the Bible says and the Word of God, will not only get saved, but able, be able to live a, a great Christian life where they will grow up to be adults that now serve the Lord under their own free will, under their own power of the Holy Spirit that is now within them. That's, that's a great wonder. Amen. That no matter how bad this world gets, that is still possible. How is it possible that when all the other marriages out there are thriving, or not thriving, but falling apart just because of, you know, money and lusts and all these other things of the world, that your marriage can thrive? If, if you listen to what the Bible says, you follow the Spirit within you, your wife follows the Spirit within her, and your relationship can just thrive and thrive and thrive. These are miracles and wonders and signs, is what these are. I mean, God, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse number 21, is just saying, you know, you know what he's saying there? He's saying, just give me something to work with. And like, you're not going to do the work. <laughs> you're not going to do the work. I mean, a good, a good check on yourself is, you know, you're like, am I spirit-filled or am I not? Well, when you go out soul winning to perform those great signs and wonders and do that great miracle of hopefully getting someone saved... Are you excited to go talk to somebody? Are you excited to knock the next door? Like, I hope I can talk to somebody today. I hope I can get out there and have a conversation. At least have a conversation with somebody. At least go out and, you know, did you get somebody saved today? No, but at least I got to give the gospel to somebody. Look, that's a person that's filled with the Spirit. Somebody that's just going out there just because, like, they want to check it off their list. That's somebody that's not filled with the Spirit. I pray every single time that I come up to preach that I would be filled with the Spirit. I, I pray that God would, would, would use me to, to do what? To, to be super smart and super clever and super funny so you're all entertained or whatever. No, that I would just have the ability to teach this word to you. That's, good. That, that's being filled with the Spirit and being excited to do so. I don't want to you know, be up here like, ugh, ugh. That's not filled with the Spirit. I should be excited to preach the gospel. You should be excited to read God's word. You should read God's Word and, and, and just, be, you just, just take your time reading it. And when you see something in God's Word that, makes you, that reminds you of something else in God's Word, you should be excited about that. It means you're filled with the Spirit. That's the Spirit working with you as you study the Word of God. Look, the point is that this is a huge tool that a lot of Christians leave on the table. Every single person, God, the, the Bible is filled with weak and underperforming and, and not as smart as everybody else, men and women who God used to do great things. Because it's God's glory that he wants to show and not our glory. If he used the most powerful people and the most powerful everybody everywhere, we could say, yeah, that king was super powerful. That's why he won that battle. And God's like, no, no, no. You only get a couple hundred people because I want people to know that I won the battle. But the point is, that is us. Gideon's army is us. Let God win some battles. All we have to do is clean up the vessel and give God something to work with. So that's John chapter 7, verse 38 and verse 39. The Holy Spirit and how it should work in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.